so again, thank you. And thanks to Glenda. Every year Glenda asks uh, various people to come in, give a presentation. Usually she gives some suggestions and out of those suggestions in the past 10 or 12 years, I've picked one of those. But today I uh, went outside the suggested list, poetic license, and I'm taking one a little different, which is from John 18, verses 28 to 38. It's a statement that Pilate makes. Now, every year on Good Friday, we, had the, we have the proclamation of the Passion according to John. On Palm Sunday, Passion Sunday, one year it's A cycle, Matthew, then Mark, then Luke. But the constant one is the Good Friday reading, and it's always the Passion narrative according to John. So I thought it would be good to just do a brief reflection on one of the statements in the Passion narrative according to John, uh, I'm not going to read the account, 18 to 38, but you'll hear it on uh, Good Friday. And you'll hear the phrase from the voice, from an, not the narrator, not Christ, and not the, uh, the crowd, but an individual who says, what is truth? And that's a direct statement from Pilate. So when Jesus is brought before Pilate, as he is in the Gospel of Matthew, and then specifically the one for today from the Gospel of John, uh, Pilate is kind of enamored by him. At first he says, uh, well, I'm, not, I'm no Jew. You take care of him. And they said, uh, we want the death sentence. And according to the statement in John, we are not allowed to give the death of the Jewish people, the Jewish governing people, could not give the death penalty. Only the Roman emperor could. That may have been a peculiar law. It may not have been consistent with some of the other activity of the Roman leaders. But they said, you are the only one who can do it. So remember that narrative just before this? Uh, he comes and Pilate says, are you a king? And he says, my kingdom is not here. But he does. Jesus does make the statement, uh, I've come to bring the truth and the truth will set you free. That's a little bit of a paraphrase. But he said, I am the truth, and that's consistent with other places in the New Testament where Jesus says, I am the light, I am the truth, I am the way. Uh, I am the truth. And that's when Pilate says to him, and here the, uh, the voice always has a difficult, how do you say what is truth? Do you say it in a sneering who cares what truth is? Or don't bother me with the truth. So that's the statement that I picked up. What did Herod or what did Pilate mean when he said, "What is truth? Uh, who cares what it is? I'm not interested in the truth." Now you won't find a, a, a footnote in any of the uh, usual Bibles about what did he mean. Uh, they, they just don't. Uh, Probably they just don't know for sure. What did he mean when he said, did he mean it in the sneering way? Well, who cares what truth is? Don't bother me with the truth. Or was it uh, an interest on his part? So the only Bible footnotes that do try to interpret it say that the only thing Pilate was interested in was this phrase that was being thrown around, a king. So they interpret Pilate's statement in light of what we know about Pilate from other literature and from the New Testament. Very limited. Very, so you really can't pin down exactly. You, you don't know exactly what Pilate meant. Whether he meant in a sneering way or a serious way. Wow, the truth? Or who cares what the truth is? Uh, those who do interpret it, they interpret it in light of what we know about Pilate. As a Roman governor, he'd be interested in two things. Taxes, things haven't changed. <laughs> if they got the taxes, that's what the Roman government wanted. The other thing was any sedition, any revolt. They were to put down any revolts in the entire Roman Empire. So revolts and taxes. So he didn't say anything about uh, anything else. He just said, are you a king? And Jesus says, you say I'm a king. Then he goes on this, I am the light, I am the truth, and the truth. 
and it's interpreted in the other statements, the truth will set you free. I am the light of the truth, and the truth will set you free. So I thought it'd be good to do a little uh, reflection on what is truth. Truth is defined in the Thomistic thought in the age of St. Thomas and the Thomist. You can see the Latin phrase, adequatio rei et intellectu. And those of you who are Latin scholars will know there should be an S at the end of intellectu. It should be I-N-T-E-L-L-E-C-T-U-S. Uh, it means truth is an equation or a correlation between what's in the mind and what's in reality. And that was the, always the initial part of epistemology, that the ideas in your mind need to correspond to the reality that you're describing. And almost every philosophy teacher of epistemology would start with, they had this technique down, they'd put a chair out in the front, and then they would say to the students, my, isn't this a marvelous bed? And a lot of students would say, it's not a bed, it's a chair. In my mind, it's a bed. Therefore, it's a bed. And they say, no, it doesn't correspond to reality. The reality is it's a chair. And they would do a lot of other things like that. That what is in your mind had to be adequate to what is in reality. And that's Thomas Aquinas' theory of truth. And Aquinas also had... Uh, the correlation there, whatever is received is received according to the mode of the receiver. If you're a human being, truth is received according to the mode of a human being. If you're a cat, it's received according to the mentality of a cat. Or if it's a dog, reality is perceived according to the mode of a dog. They usually didn't use animals, they use it. If you're an angel, truth is received according to the mode of an angel. If you're a human being, it's received according to the mode of a human being. So you could see that whatever is true and then it enters into your mind is according to the way that human beings process things. But the basic thing, to be a searcher of the truth, you have to accept the idea that what is out there in reality is similar to and adequate to what is in your mind. So if it's a chair, it has to be a chair here. It can't be a bed here and a chair there. There has to be a correspondence between that. Out of this has come, uh, as you can see in the continuation of the outline, which we'll go through very briefly, is that in moral theology, there's always been a tremendous emphasis on the truth, living the truth not some fantasy in your mind, but living the truth. And in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, number 2464 two, is entitled Living in Truth, that we are to be seekers of the truth. What is in reality out there? Grace, salvation, scripture, theology. That is received in our mind according to the mode of a human being and but it has to correlate. And you can't just say, uh, doesn't make any difference if I call it a chair and you call it a bed. So perhaps uh, it'd be easier to use a very simplistic uh, story that was always told in epistemology. It goes something like this, kind of the Reader's Digest version. Three umpires at the end of a series of games, baseball games, get together and are drinking a few beers. One umpire says, if the pitcher throws a ball and it's not in the strike zone, I call it, it's a ball. I call it a ball. If the pitcher throws a ball and it's in the strike zone, I call it a strike. The second one says, you're a little too sure of yourself. If the pitcher throws a ball and I think it is in the strike zone, I call it a strike. If the pitcher throws a ball and it, I think it's outside the strike zone, I call it a ball. 
He said, I'm not quite as sure as you say, I call it as it is. Whatever it is, I call it. And the umpire would have to say, second umpire would say, <clears throat> well, if I think it's a ball, I call it a ball. If I think it's a strike. If I perceive it as a ball, I call it a ball. If I perceive it as a strike, I call it a strike. The third umpire puts his beer down and says, you're both stupid. <laughs> and he simply says, it ain't nothing till I call it. <laughs> you can see the spectrum. What I say, that's objectively what it is. The second one, well, there's room, uh, I think, or I perceive what it is. The third one, I just name it. Doesn't make any difference whether it's in the strike zone or not. If I think it's, I just call it a strike, and then it, then it exists. But it ain't nothing till I call it. So that's been kind of the history of uh, objective truth and subjective truth. So I declare what it, I declare it to be a bed. Therefore, it is a bed. So was Pilate into that? He may or may not have been. According to the surrounding areas, he probably was just interested in tax and no revolts. I don't want any other kings. There's only one king. That's the, the emperor of Rome. Now, Thomas Aquinas, as you can see here, does define truth as truth as uprightness in human action and speech, truthfulness. Uh, there's always been in moral theology and in ethics a, a tremendous emphasis on truthfulness, to be truthful. Where did it start? Well, for me and probably a lot of you, it started when you tried to tell your mother or father a lie. <laughs> and uh, parents, and still today, say, tell me the truth. Don't lie to me. Tell me the truth. And if you didn't accept that, it was reinforced with a backhand to the face. Don't lie to me. So we've had a tremendous emphasis on the truth. Aquinas made the statement, people could not live with one another if there was not mutual confidence that they were being truthful to one another. So tremendous emphasis on truth. It extends beyond uh, the moral life. Uh, all of you who have had to testify in court, witness in court, or if you had to testify before Congress, do you swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God? That's the beginning of any uh, legal. So the legal people really emphasize, do not lie to me. Tell me the truth. Do you swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Well, <clears throat> that's because uh, they're understanding that what you saw and what you experienced, you have to tell that in a truthful way. You can't distort that. All of you know that if you lie as a witness in a court and it's proven that you lied. What do they call it? Perjury. perjury. And there are really severe punishments for perjury because lying undermines the legal system. So to tell the truth is very important. And, and just a couple of experiences from military background, Uniform Code of Military Justice. It's what you live with in the military. Uh, it's very similar to legal systems, but it's tailored and peculiar to uh, military situations. And to uh, lie in a trial in the military, it's really severe. Those people are in Leavenworth who lie in those situations uh, because it just undermines <clears throat> the whole military system if you lie. And closely associated with that in both civil and military justice is the concept of uh, 
not tampering with witnesses. If you know somebody is going to be called to be a witness in a trial, whether in military trial or civilian trial, uh, the first thing you uh, are told you can't do is talk to them. Because it could be that you're trying to tamper with a witness. And the witness would not tell the truth then. You might bargain with it. I remember two or three different occasions I was working with somebody who was in a trial, a court-martial, and uh, stupidly, in both cases, the person on trial knew that such and such would be called as a witness and called them and said, hey, you don't have to tell them all this. Just kind of uh, help me out. Well, that puts both of them in jail, tampering with witnesses. So then the legal system, the military system, and in society, it's based on being truthful, telling the truth. Now, one of the things that we have to uh, deal with in the history of the world, and in, even today, is subjectivism. You can't go to a trial and say, well, I don't think he's, I don't think he re really meant it. I don't think he was in his right mind when he did it or something like that. And I don't think he ought to be convicted. Well, the judges are not interested in that. They call that subjectivism. Because what you're saying is, what I'm going to tell you doesn't correspond to reality. Doesn't correspond to what I saw and experienced and heard. There's a phrase today that you probably have heard uh, well, everything is just a, a social construct. And it specifically gets into, uh, well, male and female, they're just convenient social constructs, and there's no difference between male and female. It's just a usable social construct. It's also used in uh, gender identity a lot. Well, Male and female, that's just a social construct. And it's kind of what you want it to be. Because there's nothing objective about being a male and nothing objective about being female. And the reason it's coming into play is in the sports system. What kind of locker rooms do you have? Uh, that's a big one, right? In the, and there are people say, well, Men's bathroom and ladies' bathrooms are women's bathrooms. That's just a convenient social structure, construct that we've had in the past. And uh, they should all be, quote, gender neutral. And we have the issue going on that you know about is uh, whether uh, you need to follow that objectively, male and female, men, women, boys, girls? And can you change your gender? And to put it in blunt terms, what your biological birth gender was, that doesn't have to correspond with what you, who you think you are. You, you can change that. And that's what's going on in society now. Uh, just one other area of newspapers. There's a controversy going on now about newspapers historically have had ethics about what they print. And to print something, investigative journalists had to have at least two different sources to verify. If they only had one, the managing editor would say, we're not putting that in because that's just one source. And we require two and maybe three sources before we'll print something so that it's objective and not just one person's subjective take on it. Well, along has come blogs. Blogs don't have any ethics about what they can put on a blog. It doesn't have to be verified by two or three people. 
what we're dealing with now is anybody can put anything on Facebook. It goes through no screening. And that's why most of you are warned about Facebook, Facebook and Twitter. It, it doesn't have to be verified by anybody. It can just be one person putting it in. Or it can be a group of people putting it in, such as Russians. And I think it's pretty well established uh, that, that they use worldwide social media to promote their, and they don't identify themselves as Russians. They have people planted throughout the world to put the Russian point of view on the blogs. BuzzFeed, I'm not that convert, I don't follow the, the blogs that much, but BuzzFeed has all kinds of political things they put on, and they don't have to be verified by anybody. If one person thinks this political point of view is right, they just put it on. Nobody's Now, if you go to a traditional newspaper, investigative journalists, they're going to say, well, how can we verify this? Who else is into this? So that's, that's a controversy, and it's in several books now. One that I just read is by a, a longtime investigative journalist for Washington Post, New York Times, etc., named Jill Abramson. It's, the title of the book gives it away, The Merchants of Truth, The Fight for Facts. Uh, obviously, from an investigative journalist background, they object to BuzzFeed and those. Anybody can put anything on Facebook, anything on Twitter, anything on the hundreds of blogs that are out there. Don't ask me to identify anymore, because I don't, <laughs> I don't put my life around blogs. So they're just saying, well, we have the right to say whatever we want, and it doesn't make any difference if it corresponds to reality or not. So there's... Uh, kind of a mood there of uh, the truth. I didn't say that I don't want to get into uh, bathroom designations. Uh, I would just uh, comment that, uh, the comment that, and I think it's true here, Starbucks is how many thousands and thousands of places? They cease to identify bathrooms as male and female, men and women, because the owner has said, uh, we're a gender neutral company and we don't, we don't want to impose on anyone. So they're just, they didn't reconstruct anything, they just took the name men and women off and now it's just called bathroom. Some people would have trouble with that. Or the truth is just, up for grabs, you can just say what you want to, and you can just suddenly say there's no such thing anymore as men's bathrooms and men's and women's bathrooms, or men's locker room and boys' locker room and men and girls' locker rooms. I don't want to get into that, but notice you didn't have to have any objective reality in these student responses. It didn't make any difference what the reality is. If you feel like you're six foot five Chinese woman, that's what you are. Uh, so you could uh, you can apply it to a lot of activity of biological gender, uh, birth gender. That's one thing, but the social construct of men and women—they're just convenient terms, and you can switch those around, and you don't have to bother with that. Now, it's very prominent in that area, but in the area of truth, uh, if you feel you're just free to say, well, I don't care if 100 people believe that a chair is a chair, I think it's a bed. And the 100 people would say, according to this theory, so be it. If it's a, if it's a bed to you, then it's a bed. If it's a chair to us, it's a chair. If it's a dog to you, that's fine, but to me it's a cat. So it doesn't have to have any correlation according to Thomistic epistemology. It doesn't have to have any correlation of what's in the mind 
also needs to be in reality, and there has to be a correspondence between the two. Now, on a personal level, I, that's pretty easy. But when you get into political realities, economic realities, it gets a little more complicated. So what is the truth economically? What is the truth politically? Uh, what is the truth in human relations? Uh, every, is everybody free? It's Constitution is a freedom of speech. But we've already had the court cases where you can't go into a dark theater in the middle of the movie and holler, fire, fire, fire. You can go to jail for that. Well, that's because we've imposed some obje objectivity about what a fire is before you can say, fire, fire, your pants are on fire. But in other areas, uh, it gets a little more complicated. And uh, I think that's what Thomas Aquinas was saying, whatever is received is received according to the mode of the receiver. And those of you who love Latin, quid quid recipitur, recipitur, secundum modum recipientis. It's according to the mode of the receiver. But you can see if you stretch that, Obviously, what I receive as truth may not come out in the same exact form in my mind as it would for you. So there is a subjective dimension to receiving truth. But if you rule out the objective dimension of truth, uh, then things are just up for, for grabs. Anybody can say anything, and you don't have to have two or three sources to verify what you say, except if you're putting it in the traditional newspapers, they're going to say, that's interesting, we'll see if two or three other people, or two or three other court cases or something, concurs with your opinion. What was it? Yesterday they were debating in Congress whether you're just free to put uh, hate speech on blogs. Right now they are. But there's a group at a test and a hearing and saying hate speech and hate activities should not be allowed to be presented as truth on the blogs or Facebook. I don't know where it'll go, but you can see where there, there are people saying, objectively, we don't want the same status for what is true as to what is a, a destructive concept. Now, so I don't want to mislead you that truthfulness on a personal level is pretty clear in our history and in ethics and morality in the Catholic Church, to be truthful, starting with don't lie to me, uh, and then working on up to the, the truth of reality. But it, and we don't have time to get into it on a social dimension, when you get into big social issues, political social issues, economic social issues, etc., it's a little tougher. And uh, obviously you get into more opinions, which it, opinions are not necessarily the truth, but it's a little more difficult. So my goal today was just to alert you to the, the status, historical status of the church. And when Pilate asks the question, what is truth? It triggers a long history of being truthful, the nature of truth, objective truth. Uh, subjective truth is not the same as objective truth. And if you want to go in on the Facebook, you can just key in all kinds. You can key in the word epistemology, spelling it the way it is in the dictionary, E-P-I-S-T-E-M-O-L-O-G-Y, rather than O. And if you want to uh, go to uh, a study of epistemology, they range from a six-minute lecture to a two-hour lecture. And they, they'll go through the history of the truth, truthfulness, objective reality, subjective reality, and how they sometimes in our history have got mixed up and how we're still dealing with it today.